In part one of this short series of videos, we show how the patch the hash attack works and how it can take a compromised machine and go through it, get the credentials for the domain controller and login DA, and we show how Curator detected all that. For this part two, we're going to show how by having a PIM server, an identity management server, with the process of checking in and checking out credentials, this attack will no longer work, regardless of how compromised one of the endpoints are. However, I did I normally do the videos all by myself, but in this particular case, I don't think I know enough about the PIM server to do a good job on showing how, how potent this technology is. So for that, I wanted to invite my friend Andy Crandall, uh, who is going to be showing us uh, about the PIN server. Andy, welcome. Hey Jose, thanks for having me on. So as Jose mentioned, uh, in this portion of the video, we're gonna talk a little bit about how um, IBM Security Privileged Vault can help us to do a couple of things. Um, this point forward, I'm gonna refer to the vault as the vault um, instead of IBM Security Verified Privileged Vault, because it's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, Jose, can you drive us over to the Vault. Absolutely. All right. Thank you very much. So here we have um, an implementation of the vault. And within this, um, there are a lot of different features and functionality, but we're going to be highlighting a couple of very specific ones today. Uh, the important thing to note about the pre-configuration here is that essentially we have various folders and those folders can be associated um, or c c permissions can be controlled to them via role-based access control. So this particular folder has con access to it locked down to only very specific groups and users who need access to this domain admin credential. Now, generally speaking, each secret is going to be a, a, a bundle of metadata essentially associated to an account. Um, and it's going to keep empirical history of previous passwords, previous usernames, anything that you need in here. What we're going to be taking a look at, though, is this feature called Require Checkout. What Checkout is going to do is it's, I, I like to think of it like checking out a library book. When a user checks out this secret, they're essentially going to gain exclusive access to it. No other user can access it while the secret is checked out. You can specify a time for that. And more critically, we're going to be enabling change password on check-in. So what this is going to do is it's functionally going to create one-time use passwords for anybody who leverages this secret. We're going to go ahead and hit save. Check that secret out again, because as soon as that setting is enabled, we need to check it out in order to be able to access it. From here, we can just simply check this credential in. And what the tool is going to do is actually queue this credential to be rotated. So it's actually going to reach out to Active Directory. It's going to automatically change that password to a new randomly generated credential. And it's going to check the secret back in. So this time, when we come in and we take a look, we can see that we have a complex password that has been implemented on this secret and changed in Active Directory. There is a heartbeat status, and this is actually the system reaching out to Active Directory and doing an authentication attempt with this password to validate whether or not that is actually what's set in Active Directory. So by doing this, we have essentially uh, invalidated any previous hashes that a user had used in a previous session. We can also launch directly from the vault into uh, an RDP launcher. Jose, do you want to punch in the IP address of the Windows machine? Sure. 172.60.60.21. Looks like we got a typo. We Oops. need a 17. I'm sorry. Let me no, no worries. Just hit can cancel. Cancel here. So, so what we're alluding to is actually a slight change in user workflow. So instead of your administrators uh, having a saved admin password that they leverage, they'll actually come into a tool. They'll be challenged for multi-factor authentication when they first authenticate. And then they'll be leveraging role-based access control to only access the credentials that they need to get their job done. From there, they can launch directly into servers to do work. And all of that is going to be audited from end to end. On top of that, once we're done with the work, we can close out of our session, check our secret back in, and the system is automatically going to go ahead and rotate that credential. So instead of a persistent hash B 
being valid for for potentially many months, right? We're shortening that life cycle down to be 30 minutes or less, and that's a completely configurable time. Uh, but for the purpose of this demonstration, uh, we have it set for 30 minutes. So what we're going to do next is we're going to rerun that exploit. Okay, so I'm going to start from scratch here, bringing the Kali system. I'm going to do sudo. I'm going to bring the resource file for the attack. The machine was, this is the same machine that was compromised before, and what we will notice is that there should be an automatic session, again, established automatically without we having to click on that Word document again uh, because of the persistency of the attack, right? So here we see it. We have, again, the session one uh, already established. You want me to prepare for escalation of privilege? Uh? Yes, please. Sure. So we're going to, as before, we show this in part one. We're going to be using a Windows exploit that essentially bypasses the UAC. So we're going to first the session as the trampoline for this one. And we need to do a part of uh, setup uh, commands, right? For the payload? Correct. So we need to configure the payload. The reason we need to set a special payload is because we want to target the x64 infrastructure. Uh, the Windows machine that we're exploiting is a 64-bit machine. And so we want to make sure we're targeting that specifically. It's x64, Metropreter. and reverse CCP. And we need Excellent. to set up the... I'm going to set the target. So again, we just want to target very specifically that x64 infrastructure. And there you have it. There we go. I think we're ready to exploit. Let's do it. And as before, we get the second session that can bypass the user access control to escalate privileges. Let's actually do that, right, Andy? You got it. So no. running get system actually elevates our permissions on that machine to the system computer level account. Once we've done that, now we want to load Kiwi, which is essentially an updated library for Mimikatz. And we're going to be using Mimikatz commands to pull those credentials out of memory. So the first thing we're going to do is validate that we have the appropriate level of permissions to perform the next tasks. So we're going to run a privilege debug. We get the okay there. And the next command we're going to run is secure LSA logon passwords. And what this is going to do is actually scrape from memory any authenticated sessions uh, that exist on that machine. And there we are. Excellent. So now we can see a list of all the authenticated credentials that exist here with their corresponding password hashes. If they had an associated Kerberos ticket, some information would be there. Um, but we're really interested in the NTLM hash. So we're looking for the administrator account that we exploited before. And as we can see, there is a, a new NTLM hash, hash associated with this credential. So let's grab that one because we are going to use it in crafting the secure the next command for Kiwi to log in. And I'm going to do that, if I may, going by my, I have my editor here and I copy the command that we used before and I'm going to be pasting this new NTLM hash. Let me grab the whole thing get back here. Should we so, go ahead? You know, what this next command is essentially going to do is tell the machine, hey, go ahead and authenticate with this associated hash and use that to open a PowerShell session. Now, 
I mean, PowerShell is a very powerful tool for Windows administration. It's also a very viable mechanism for exploit. So we're going to go ahead and run that. And that's going to create a PowerShell session. Uh, it's going to give us an output. And it's going to show us the hash we authenticated against and also the process ID of that PowerShell session. So the next thing we need to do is we're going to actually enter a shell on that Windows machine through Meterpreter. Once we're there, we'll elevate our permissions up to a PowerShell window, which gives us access to all the PowerShell commandlets. And then we're going to run a specific commandlet called enter PS host process. We're going to target the process ID of the, pat, the, the, the exploited session that we created. So enter PS host process. We use the ID flag to specify the ID that we want. Which is 3892, as we saw before, right? Correct. And now we can see that our prompt has changed to show that we are authenticated and we are in process 3892, and we have a Windows System 32 prompt. So at this point, now we are ready to scale horizontally. So, Jose, do you want to enter the command to... I'll be happy to. The very same command that we did with the who, who, who am I that was successful before. Now it should not be because of what you did, Andy, correct? Exactly. So the, the logic here, as Jose gets the command entered, is that because we have essentially rotated the credential every time uh, it gets used, that hash is no longer valid. So we're still able to authenticate to the previously, to, to pass that hash uh, into the local machine, but we already have system access. So we're not really gaining anything um, through this piece. But what we have prevented is the ability to scale laterally throughout the environment. So not only are we not going to be able to execute commands against the domain controller, but we wouldn't be able to authenticate against any other server in this environment because it's essentially going to need to check against Active Directory to validate what that credential is. Let's go ahead. I hit enter and notice what we get. Could not access. So yeah, just in summary, you know, a couple of things that are important to remember in your environment is that, you know, credential lifetime scopes should be as small as is feasible, right? We should be leveraging role-based access control in order to gain access to these privileged credentials. And as often as we can, we should be invalidating password hashes by rotating those credentials to new complex passwords so that attack vectors like pass the hash attacks can't be leveraged in your environment. Andy, thank you very much for showing us how PIM can prevent the, the pass the hash uh, attacking. In part three, we're going to be showing how you deal with an incident like this, a phishing incident, in the best possible way with our SOAR tool. Thank you, Andy. Thanks for having me on, Jose.